Greetings and good morning. I hope you're all enjoying the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association's International Stroke Conference here in sunny Los Angeles. I want to thank those of you who've traveled from around the globe to be with us, as well as those viewing remotely. We do hope you'll be able to join us for ISC next year in Denver. Before this conference has even begun, we're already off to a fabulous start. Early media coverage of the science being presented here has generated over 1.5 billion media impressions. Congratulations to everyone who has shared their science with us and with the world. I'm also happy to welcome Dr. Ralph Sacco as the new editor of Stroke. As you may know, Ralph was the first neurologist to be president of the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association, and my successor, Dr. Mitch Elkin, will be the second. In addition to being great leaders of our organization, Ralph and Mitch are terrific teachers and mentors. In my day job as chair of medicine at Stanford University, I aspire to do the same, which is why I hope my message today will resonate with those of you who are early in your career. You are the future of our profession, of the AHA ASA, of your home institutions, and your communities around the world. In multiple ways at this meeting, we'll be seeing evidence from all aspects of the science relevant to stroke and learning new ways to discover and to work with that evidence. Why is this so valuable? Because evidence matters. Evidence matters in basic discovery science and in the translation of science from the bench to the bedside and then to the community. Evidence affects the quality of the care we provide and it supports our advocacy for improvements in health policy. It's highly motivating to get up every morning knowing that we are part of one of the most important pursuits that humans can undertake, the search for truth. I make that point because we're living in a time when scientific misinformation abounds and is heavily promoted, often by those with self-interests. Facts often matter less, and truth may even be suppressed. But I believe that the truth always, eventually, wins. And as both individual clinicians and scientists, and as an organization committed to public health, people trust us. And along with that trust comes an obligation to accurately communicate the evidence and its implication. This goes beyond publishing our science. We need to combat the misinformation that can be so damaging to the health of our patients and the public. I know that early career investigators worry about funding, which is a perpetual challenge in the pursuit of evidence. So I want to be sure you recognize the AHA ASA's pivotal role in the support of science. AHA ASA is the largest nonprofit funder of cardiovascular and stroke research outside the federal government and carries about $500 million in research grant obligations at any one time. Last year, we invested over $180 million to fund more than 830 new research projects, with over 75% of those awards going to early career investigators. I'm happy to note that last fiscal year, our commitment to stroke-related research totaled $41.9 million for 112 awardees. Of those, $11 million in funding went to 81 early career investigators. We are proud that the AHA has supported the early careers of 14 Nobel Prize winners, and we want to support your research too. We also invest in strong advocacy to protect and expand essential funding options, particularly the NIH and other federal research agencies. Let me tell you a little about what led me to the pursuit of evidence. I've always been driven to figure out clinical problems, things that we don't fully understand. Early in my career at Duke, I was particularly interested in acute coronary thrombosis in the setting of the cardiac cath lab, and that enticed me into participating in and learning about clinical trials. 
as a junior faculty member, I was increasingly included in protocol design discussions, in steering committees, and in learning how to coordinate large and often global trials. I learned how to assemble, analyze, and present the data at scientific meetings, and ultimately even to regulatory authorities. It was thrilling to me to learn about the clinical investigation of new drugs and to see those drugs make enough of a difference for patients that they're still in clinical use today. An essential lesson I learned was that simplicity in integrating research into practice settings was key to making these trials happen. I also learned that clinical trials involving medical products often require the collaboration and support of industry to maintain the public's trust in the evidence we discover. Independence in the design and conduct of a trial and in the analysis and dissemination of its results is essential. At the Duke Clinical Research Institute, we developed a system for remaining independent from industry sponsors while still being collaborative. That independence was also critical in convincing policymakers that our evidence was trustworthy. Because of the important intersection between evidence generation and regulatory policy development, we worked with these federal regulators on issues related to drug development, review, and approval. This even led to my serving as a member and then as a two-term chair of the FDA's Cardiovascular and Renal Drugs Advisory Committee. If you're invited to participate in this process at any level, I encourage you to do this. My federal colleagues tell me that the process needs us, and having been there, I know that that's true. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s, the need for independent academic oversight of randomized clinical trials led us and others around the world to build academic, clinical, data, and statistical coordinating centers that could serve as hubs for collaborative research. And the AHA pushed hard for having all clinical trials listed on a central source, clinicaltrials.gov which has become an important international resource, assuring that negative trials don't just disappear. These initiatives demonstrated that evidence matters, and trustworthy evidence matters even more. It matters especially when we use this evidence to keep our clinical practice guidelines timely, accessible, and trustworthy. But there's not as much of the highest quality evidence such as that derived from multiple randomized clinical trials as we need. When we assessed our clinical practice guidelines in 2009, this highest level of evidence was only available to support 11% of recommendations. And that has not improved, according to a more recent study. This knowledge gap certainly provides an opportunity to do better, to create that better evidence. But again, how can we support that research? For many clinical questions, companies have no financial incentives to fund trials. In the U.S., our major federal funder for stroke and brain disease research is the NINDS. And we've seen an excellent return on the NINDS's investment in public health through support of clinical trials ranging from prevention to acute treatment. The NINDS commitment to the stroke net is an example of coordinated efforts to organize small and large stroke clinical trials. This network of 25 regional centers across the U.S., including more than 200 hospitals, was designed to be the infrastructure and the pipeline for new potential treatments for patients with stroke or those who are at risk for stroke. This is an example of a nationwide learning healthcare and clinical trial system. Because evidence matters, we need to seek to build more of this model. Evidence is also important when the AHA sets its decade-long goals. You may know that in 2000, the AHA set a goal of reducing deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke in the U.S. by 25% by 2010. Our metrics were age-adjusted death rates provided by our partners at the CDC. We worked especially hard to foster evidence-based therapies via guidelines, 
performance measures and quality improvement initiatives. One of the most impactful QI initiatives has been Get With The Guidelines, which continues to help healthcare providers improve the acute care and prevention they deliver. In particular, Get With The Guidelines stroke has been especially beneficial. Of the nearly 2,500 Get With The Guidelines hospitals, nearly 2,400 include Get With The Guidelines stroke, with the numbers steadily growing each year. We also partner with hundreds more hospitals worldwide. Altogether, by 2010, we had done very well with a greater than expected decline in both coronary disease and stroke deaths. While we also had some success in reducing disparities in care, substantial health inequity still persisted at the end of that decade. And we took that into account as we moved toward the next 10 years. In 2010, we announced our next goal, by 2020, to improve the cardiovascular health of all Americans by 20%, while reducing deaths from cardiovascular diseases and stroke by 20%. With the phrase, all Americans, we committed to examining everything through a health equity lens, and we expanded our reach to address all cardiovascular diseases as well as stroke. We started off well, but the decline in deaths, both from cardiovascular disease and from stroke, began plateauing around 2014. And there's been an increase in age-adjusted stroke deaths over the last four years. The unfortunate reality is that our progress has stalled in cardiovascular disease. And worse, we are losing ground in stroke. Subsetting and analyzing the data has shown us that we have had some pockets of success as with our old foe, coronary heart disease. Deaths from coronary heart disease have declined more than 20% over this period, and the decline is seen across racial and ethnic subgroups. While we haven't come close to full equity, there is progress. Heart failure, on the other hand, in almost all racial, ethnic subgroups, seems to be responsible for at least part of the plateauing in cardiovascular disease. We suspect it may also contribute to the increasing death rates from stroke. We know from Get With The Guidelines that the problem is not worse acute performance in our hospitals. Just as one example, look at the door to needle time in less than 45 minutes. While there's still room to improve, we've made substantial progress over this decades. Get With The Guidelines is also helping us more rapidly deploy recent advances, such as mechanical thrombectomy. But it doesn't explain the rise in age-adjusted stroke deaths. Clearly, we need more data, more evidence, and this remains a high priority. Population data, another important form of evidence, tells us that improvements in cardiovascular and brain health are strongly related to education, income, and zip code, even more than genetic code. This recent study reported that low-income counties in the U.S. had less improvement than high-income counties. And an AHA presidential advisory released just last week points out a major health divide between urban America and the 60 million people living in rural communities. So when we look at the entire landscape, we see opportunities to make a difference. This has nothing to do with ideology. This is about truth, because evidence matters. Evidence also matters in issues such as diversity in the workforce. When investigators select the diseases or the topics they pursue, they are often more sensitive to the needs of others like themselves and those in their own communities. To be sure that we're addressing the needs of all members of our society, those of us who train and hire investigators need to find and nurture individuals reflecting our diverse population. Over the last 30 years, I've mentored and trained many diverse individuals. Learning their cultures and perspectives has broadened my own worldview in seeking to make sure that our profession leaves no talent behind. I'm proud to say that those relationships have made me both a better scientist and a better person. 
A particular type of student I've recently begun mentoring is one I especially relate to, the first generation college student. Not only was I the first person in my family to attend college, I think I was the first in my neighborhood. I can relate to the struggles these students face, everything from imposter syndrome to not understanding career opportunities that might be readily available. First generation medical students face many of the same issues, and I've become personally committed to helping, and I hope that those of you who've walked this sometimes lonely path will share your time and expertise with these students and trainees. Sharing your story is a way of making another kind of evidence matter. Science related to heart and brain health now exists in the world of big data, where it is estimated that medical data doubles every 73 days. This requires us to think differently about the design of clinical trials and to develop new tools. The adaptable trial is a great example of doing a trial differently. We've used innovative technologies to screen the electronic health records of hundreds of thousands of patients to answer a critically important clinical question. What is the optimal dose of aspirin for patients with coronary artery disease? 15,000 patients linked to the protocol by 40 US health systems have volunteered to help. This approach to link patients with this trial is much more efficient than using hundreds of individual sites. Remarkable. And it's another step forward in study design similar to the advances by the Swedish investigators who created the randomized registry trial. We look forward to the next innovation, and it could come from someone in this audience. I believe we've only scratched the surface of optimizing the generation of evidence. We have available to us huge amounts of data from basic science information to EHRs to public and population health data sets, including information on the environment, housing, income, racial and ethnic diversity, and more. Cloud computing enables the AHA's Institute for Precision Cardiovascular Medicine to make sense of data like this, using advanced methods like AI and machine learning. The Institute also provides funding for the data scientists who make this happen. But these approaches need to be held to the same level of scientific scrutiny as drugs and devices. Evidence matters, and it can lead to a better future. HA is fully invested in using big data resources, technology tools, and novel computational methods to better understand issues related to heart disease, including in women. The HA has partnered with Verily and Project Baseline to create Research Goes Red, a technology platform to enroll and engage a million women to contribute their health data for investigation into heart and brain health. With the input of these women, we'll design a competitive research portfolio that addresses their needs and concerns. As we come back to the end, let's go back to where we began with one more message for early career investigators and clinicians. This is the most exciting time ever to be engaged in science and its application to clinical medicine and public policy. Sure, we have challenges, but every generation has challenges. What makes our opportunity so spectacular is that we have unprecedented ways to gather data and to generate insights at a scale and speed our predecessors dreamed about. I believe in our future because I believe in everyone everywhere who's creating it. Together, we will provide the curiosity to raise the right questions, the passion to find the answers, the willingness to publish and speak the truth to decision makers, and we'll do it all through an equity lens. So the message I want you to take home from this speech is that evidence matters. In all aspects of treating and preventing cardiovascular disease and stroke, in all nations around the globe, we have to prioritize gathering the highest quality evidence, and we need to rely on that evidence for the decisions we make. A world of longer, healthier lives will be the ultimate evidence of our success. 
Thank you very much.